trade war has a peaceful ending, wine bottles will get a lot more complicated. Okay, so if we have a peaceful ending to this trade war, we're going to have more complex wine bottles. And perhaps more complex wines. Welcome to the knock-on effect. Welcome to the show where we start with the thing you know and end up in a strange place. I'm Alex Rosenberg, joined by my fine and rare co-host, Justine Underhill. Hello, hello. Hello. I am going to try to get you from tariff venom to tipple vessels. And your job is to figure out where I'm going. From where to where? Tariff venom. Tariff venom. To tipple vessels. Tipple vessels. Tipple being a drink, okay. if you will. Gotcha. Uh, your job is to figure out where I'm going before I get there. With that in mind, Justine. Well, as we've learned in other knock-on effect episodes. Yes, and this has a lot of... There's a lot of crossovers tying. Yeah, I feel like we can bring in some of our previously learned knowledge. Yes. Um, so there's a wonderful episode you did about the wine industry. And so my guess is that maybe wine bottle manufacturers are in the crosshairs somehow of the trade war because, um, you know, glass is a very important industry. Is this, yeah, that might no, be correct, but I that's not where I'm going. Okay. <laughs> not where I'm going today. So, so, starting with the thing we do know, which is the the trade war, the tough talk, and the the tough actions. U.S. has levied tariffs on. I love how it's levied tariffs. Isn't that great? On two hundred fifty billion dollars worth of Chinese goods, China retaliated, issuing tariffs on one hundred ten billion dollars. U.S. could issue tariffs on another three hundred billion dollars. Why do you like the word levy? I think it's just levied. Because you only hear it with tariffs. It's like one of those verbs that's only associated with a particular noun. So there's been this tit for tat, and China has, has called off trade talks. So the, it, it only looks to continue. So the base case is definitely not that the trade war eases up. And it's affected China. So recent GDP numbers are always a bit suspect in China. Yes, I know. But uh, recently, they're growing at the slowest pace since 2009, a rate of just 6.5%. And the stock market and the currency markets have been a bit troubled. Now we're recording this on Monday. Stock market's rising due to some talk about tax cuts. Maybe a page from Trump's uh, book with, with talking about tax cuts. But you know, the, the overall lesson is that that China is is imperiled by what's going on with trade. And the, I guess the big question is how long can this sort of trade war last? In one sense, the U.S. can levy tariffs on a bunch of Chinese goods, but China can't retaliate in the same amount of force because guess what? China doesn't import as many U.S. goods as the U.S. imports of Chinese goods. So that creates a bit of an imbalance there. Yeah, sure. And, and actually, I, I could say more about this. I'm going to toss to a clip of AK, who uh, in, in the latest episode of Real Vision's latest show, The One Thing, kind of discussed this dynamic and, and how China is particularly uh, feeling the pain. China is facing major issues because they haven't shifted to a consumer-based economy like the U.S. They're completely dependent on exports and they're leveraged out of their mind with all their debt spending. The U.S., on the other hand, has a self-sustaining economy. We've got everything we need in-house. We've got manufacturing, natural resources, consumers, investors, absolutely everything we got. We're just like Sears. Well, you know, Sears from back in the day. And this means that we're in a great position against China when it comes down to a trade war. By the way, everyone check out the show. Good job, AK. Um, and so the point is that if the U.S. takes a step back from the trade war... Is that something that you think the U.S. would do? Probably not, but, but who knows? I mean, politics is, is up in the air. There's a lot in the mix here. So anyone who's been trying to predict the actions of the Trump presidency... It's a possibility. Yeah. Not base case, but a possibility. Yeah, and, and it would have to rely on China, too. I mean, if China really said, if China really ended up in a lot of trouble and they said, hey, you know what, we, we have issues here, we're going to try to make nice with the U.S., you know, perhaps that would do the trick. Okay. Um, and then Trump could declare a win, et cetera. So if all that did happen, it would be good news, I think, for a group of people who are quite used to hearing good news. And that would be collectors and sellers of fine and rare uh, wines. Ah, so why are they used to hearing good news? Well, the prices have been skyrocketing. I'll get back to China in a second, but I want to tell you about something that happened uh, in, our, in our fair Berg a couple weeks ago. On October 13th, um, Sotheby's, the auction house, auctioned off a bunch of wines from the personal seller of Robert Druhin, the great Burgundy vintner. Also, by the way, has done some interesting things in Oregon. 
in the Willamette Valley, which I mentioned in the hazelnut episode, if you remember. Oh, yes. So two of the lots that were auctioned off, uh, numbers 84 and 85, were unusually special because each contained a single bottle, a single bottle of uh, Domaine de la Romanie Conti uh, 1945 from the Romanie Conti vineyard. Okay. And I'll just quote Bloomberg for a bit of context uh, of why these wines are so special. The year was hot overall. The wine super concentrated, and thanks to hail and frost, production was small. Only 600 bottles of Romani Conti were made, and at this point, very few are left. Furthermore, after the harvest, the vines were ripped out and the vineyard replanted. The next vintage of Romani Conti was 1952. You know, just to, because it's relevant to the bees, I'm just going to go on a brief detour to explain why they ripped out the vines from the greatest vineyard uh, in the world, arguably. Here's Kelly White writing for Guildsum. Quote, during phylloxera, phylloxera is, uh, remember, the mite that you would eat through the, uh, through, the the, through the vines. And completely destroy. The French wine whole industry. So what they had to do is they had to take American rootstocks, which were resistant to phylloxera, and graft their existing vines onto American rootstocks. But a couple vineyards, like the most expensive, finest vineyards, instead treated their vines with carbon disulfide, which apparently kept the phylloxera away. Huh. Although it's quite expensive. So, so here's so they, they, it was it was sort of kept in its pure form. These were not grafted in any way, so you didn't have some sort of like Frankenstein plants. Yeah, created. I mean, most people say there's no way to tell the difference between a wine that was grafted and wine that wasn't, but other people disagree. Yeah, so here's Kelly White and Guildsum. During phylloxera, many less prestigious vineyards were left to languish, as only the top producers could afford the expensive CS2 injections that kept the louse at bay. Famously, the last vineyards to be replanted onto grafted vines in Burgundy were Domaine de la Romanie Conti's Romanie Conti and part of Richebourg. Both were pulled out in 1945 when the war made carbon disulfide impossible to come by and were replanted in 1947. So this is, these are very, very special. Extremely wines. special. I mean, But it's kind of only in people's minds because maybe the grafted vines were just as good. True, but... You know, this wine is said to get better as it ages, even even for decades. And you know, it, it's an extreme. So, so DRC owns uh, uh, five different uh, vineyards, I believe, and one of them, Romani Conti, is considered the best. So, even in a regular year, even if you bought it new, it'd be very expensive. But the whole story and the history and the you know the mythology makes it extremely important. Cool. So. Sotheby's estimate for the price uh, that these would sell for was, you know, official estimate. They always have an official estimate, right, with, with an auction. Was twenty-two thousand to thirty-two thousand dollars. Here's what happened in the room per before. bottle or per case for, for the bottle. Yeah, one for each bottle. Wow. And here's what happened in the room according to Wine Spectator. Quote: Rob Rosania, a New York real estate developer and noted wine collector, raised his paddle and left it there. 150, 160, 170, 180, 200. Auctioneer Jamie Ritchie rattled off in rapid fire as if he was counting. Those numbers were actually thousands of dollars, salvos in a bidding war between Rosania and an unidentified online bidder. Wow, so just holding up the panel, or paddle, I guess, trying to scare off. Yeah, just the... saying, I, I, don't, I don't care. And the, eventually, though, he did take down the paddle. The online bidder won. One. And the online bidder won with a final hammer price of $558 thousand dollars including buyers fee and taxes five hundred and fifty eight thousand dollars half a million dollars for one bottle of wine uh rosania did get the second bottle for for four hundred ninety six thousand dollars as a wine connoisseur would you say that there is any bottle that is worth half a million dollars so so these two bottles were promptly became the one and two most expensive bottles ever sold at auction and this is all this is all recently just happened on, on October 13th in New York. This is how you know we're in a bubble. Well, when people are spending this much on wine. Per perhaps, perhaps, but, but you know, maybe it speaks to, uh, maybe people are just realizing how tasty wine is, no, you know, all of a no, sudden. No, no, no. it's a funny story. I was at an auction on uh, Saturday, the Zaki's auction, um, the Vault 2 at La Bernadette. Of course. And it was really funny because I saw this bidding war happen in the room, which was really exciting. Not the same prices, but it was a... I think <laughs> Not it, in the half million dollar range. Well, it was six bottles, I believe, of, of white burgundy. And there were two couples, both at the front of the room. And they were going, here, you know, and, and, and it was like $60,000. And then the other couple was like looking at each other. 
Seventy thousand dollars. Oh my gosh. And the other couple was looking at each other, and it was like happening in the room, and the auctioneer was like kind of like egging them on. How high did it go? And he was like, "She's looking at him. She wants it. She wants it." And it it ended at uh, ninety thousand dollars before buyers taxes and fees. So, so uh, anyway, um, I don't think anything could taste that good, but maybe that's just my humble. Although they did. The thing is, if you go to the auctions, they give you free wine, which is nice. By the way, just, just uh, as a bit of a note, the previous title had been held, and this made me go to your point about a bubble, by a Jeroboam, which is four bottles worth of Mouton Rothschild 1945, same year, interestingly, but from Bordeaux this time, that sold for uh, $311,000 in 2007. Wow, another bubble. It's a good point. And in July, LiveX, which tracks fine wine prices, reported, quote, Burgundy prices have risen relentlessly in 2018, and they have an index called the Burgundy 150. It's kind of like the S&P 500. Sure, which they use to track the market and, and just look at the performance of the past year compared to the other types of wine. So it, it's just absolutely skyrocketed. And again, that's even before we saw the two most expensive bottles ever sold, both Burgundies. So why do you think Burgundy has been doing so well? Yeah, they actually made some interesting conclusions in a February report called Burgundy, the market's favorite tipple. Ah, there's that word again. Oh. Um, and, and they found, quote, in the context of growing global wealth and constrained Burgundy supply, more money is chasing fewer bottles. This in turn puts pressure on prices. At Burgundy's loftiest price points for rare older vintages, there are a limited number of potential buyers in the world, but this number has been steadily growing. The broadest possible measure of extreme wealth, the number of known billionaires, has doubled since 2007. In China alone, this figure has grown from none in 2007 to 319 in 2017. And they note some interesting uh, correlations between the Hang Seng Index, the NASDAQ, and the Burgundy 150. It's literally just the same chart. Huh. So... Going up. Yeah. And, and this just makes sense, right? Because bottles of top Burgundy are, are the literal definition of, of a luxury good. And, and, and because of their scarcity, it's, it's even more than luxury. It's, it's like you can't even obtain, obtain it if you want to. So uh, CNBC's Robert Frank wrote last week, quote, While wealthy Chinese wine buyers drove up the prices of Bordeaux in the early 2000s, they quickly shifted to Burgundy, which are much more scarce. So really, it's the idea of going after the most sought-after item, or, you know, it's sort of like because it's so rare, it becomes even more difficult to obtain. Exactly. that pushes up the price even more. So, So it's not even because people like the taste better. It's only because it's rare that makes it even more rare. Right. I mean, okay, you know, this is not a big part of it, but... Fashions in the wine world do shift a lot, and Bordeaux wines are a big and more, you know, a bit more harsh and a bit more powerful and, and fruit forward. Burgundy is a bit more subdued, a bit more subtle. There has been maybe a shift in trend, so Burgundy is seen as a bit cooler. Bordeaux, uh, these are Bordeaux's. Are, cooler are, as in like, you know, hip? Yeah, okay. I, I think Bordeaux's Not are seen as a bit passe, a bit like old banker wines of the last bubble, if you will. Uh, and this is more. This is the, of, the 2018 bubble. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so of course, if the trade war heats up, Chinese buyers are going to be less able or less inclined to buy these expensive bottles of Burgundy. It still will be the cool bottle of wine, though. I mean, that's not going to take it away. Sure. Well, we'll, well, we'll see. I mean, you know, tastes change. Just say taste in the art world change. You know, Bordeaux is very tough, macho kind of like investment banker kind of wine, if you will. Burgundy may be a bit more subtle, a bit more intellectual you know, a bit more of a techie wine. I, I'm not sure. Sure. Okay, so basically what would happen, though, is if maybe, let's say, there's a big crash in China, they don't have as much money, so they might not um, push up the prices of the Bordeaux market. Yeah, naturally, it, it has to be bad for, for Burgundy prices. And, and it's actually, the trade war is probably bad for rich people all over the world. I mean, arguably, the greatest benefits of globalization go to the people who own companies or, or have vast amounts of capital. Arguably, you know, moves toward nationalization or nationalism are bad for rich people all over the world. But let's stick with what will happen if we continue going down the current path. Because I started this, remember, saying if the trade war uh, has a peaceful ending. Ah, right. So if it does and wine prices continue to go stratospheric, guess what else we'll see a rise in? Uh, tipples. Sure. But um, we'll also see a rise in counterfeiting. Yes, that brings us back to the honey industry as well. Yeah, a lot, lot of, lot of parallels here. So counterfeiting has bedeviled the world of 
fine wine, particularly fine wine resale, such as at auctions. And just take the 1945 Romani Conti, which we've been talking about. Uh, Maureen Downey, who runs wine authentication and valuation business, Chai Consulting, said in 2016 that she herself had handled, quote, more Domaine de la Romani Conti, Romani Conti 1945, than has been made. Oh, so there's more that exists than... Because it's, I mean, 600 bottles, it's, it's like two barrels of wine. So what do people put into it? So people will... Is it diluted or is it completely faked? It's completely faked with wines that taste similar. And think about it, I mean, th this stuff is, is tough because the person who opens a bottle of 1945, they've never had a bottle of 1945 before. And if they did, the other one was probably faked. So how would you even, how would you even know? Like, as, as this is, again, a lot of parallels to honey. So Jancis Robinson, quoting from her, wine, liquid and unpredictable, can hardly be easier to doctor, unfortunately, even to a standard capable of convincing professionals. Indeed, our favorite drink has been adulterated and counterfeited since at least the first century AD, when Pliny the Elder complained that, quote, not even our nobility ever enjoys wines that are genuine. You know, it's a dark liquid in a bottle that constantly changes. Changes even once you open it. You know, if you put it in the glass, you have it now or you have it in 30 minutes, vastly different. So if someone's really good at faking these things. Yeah. And like, and the other thing is that, I mean, this kind of gets back to my point of what's a half million dollar wine taste like. Right. Like, I, I think people have an idea of wine or it's, it's more the idea of buying something really expensive. Um, and that almost that psychological process makes it taste better because um, we have an idea of, of, you know, what it should be, but maybe it's actually not even the real stuff. I can't tell, I could not tell you the difference between. Uh, but you're a super taster. I'm a super taster, but I'm not a wine aficionado. Okay. So I could tell you the difference between a $2 bar of chocolate and a $10 one. I can't I tell you the most wine. expensive bar of chocolate ever sold. <laughs> Counterfeiting, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a gigantic problem, especially the greatest wines are auctioned off, I mean, at auctions like the one I went to on Saturday. So, you know, if those things are real or fake, I mean, who, who can really tell? So, and, and Serena Sutcliffe, who ran Sotheby's wine business for 25 years, whose tasting notes are quoted in the description of the lots that earned the records, said in 2006 that the great Bordeaux wine that previously held the record, uh, Mouton Rothschild in 1945, quote, Mouton Rothschild with no providence whatsoever is appearing as if it grew on trees. Certainly much more has been sold than was ever made. And there have been some high-profile scandals. Uh, Rudy Kurnia won, is now serving 10 years in prison for counterfeiting more than $30 million worth of wine. Great documentary about this called Sour Grapes that I recommend everyone check out. But it, 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 it's, um, it's endemic. But do we even know the authenticity of the wine that sold for half a million dollars? And, and this is a good question, and this actually explains the price. We, you can never know for sure. However, as I mentioned, it came from the personal seller of Robert Druheen, who sourced it as part of his job. We know that he had his hands on some real 1945 DRCs. God knows what happened, but it, it's pretty much as good as it gets in terms of the provenance of, of that kind of wine. So if prices continue to rise, the temptation to fake them will only rise as well. But since this is a cat and mouse game, not just a, a mouse game, there are things that winemakers can do to fight back. Ah. So here is a bottle of Rioja, a uh, half bottle. And this gold netting is probably the oldest anti-counterfeiting measure. So Rioja producers found that, that people would you know, drink the wines, take the old bottles, fill it with plonk, and resell it. So what uh, Marquis de Riscal and other Rioja producers like, uh, like this one started doing is putting gold wire around it. So you can't open the bottle without damaging the wire. And if the wire is not on it, you know that, that there's a problem with the bottle. But could I make a bottle and just add some wire to it? Yeah, it's probably not the best system. Okay. Uh, a more modern technology is uh, this bottle of, lovely bottle of Bordeaux has, you see that little uh, QR, do you have a QR scanner oh, on your phone? Oh, yeah, maybe? let me see if this works. We'll see where this goes. Um, that's so funny. So this is basically a new security measure. Yes. Here we go. Let's see where it takes us. Got it. So this takes me to the website of Leo 2014 Rouge. Right, so now... Oh, so it's a, the website for the bottle of wine. Correct, but scroll down Okay. At, to, the, to the very bottom there. Oh, and this is the bottle. The very bottom. Keep going? Yeah, I'm at the bottom. Okay, so you see that thing? Yeah. That tag? That needs to match exactly the pattern on the actual bottle of wine. So are you supposed to, in the store, be able to match these up? Yeah, or... or you know, it's hard to buy uh, counterfeit wine when it's new, but especially for a vintage bottle, you know, they let you inspect them before the auction. So you could 
you would be pretty confident if you saw, I mean, now there's probably some way to fake this, but you would be pretty confident if you saw the bottle that, uh, that you have the right thing. Ah, uh, okay. And then this is, is even more interesting. This is uh, Chateau de Isson uh, from 2009. I have no idea how that tastes, but there is kind of a uh, hologram effect on here. And I'm told that there is microtext on the bottle itself. So I've prepared a magnifying glass and you can see, uh, I think it's like uh, around here, there should be some tiny text that tells you something about the wine. Huh. Oh. Where is the text? This kind of feels like Illuminati sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Where's Dan Brown when you need him? But actually, just before we taped, I think I did find it. In all seriousness, look, like right, let's see. I see it in the magnifying glass. It's, it's sort of in this tower. Do you see, do you see where it says there's like the little text in there? In the on, tower. Like on, on the, the thing between the towers. Or be between the floors, rather. Oh. I actually do think there's text there. Wow. Do you, That's really small. So this is basically like anti-counterfeiting measures like they would use on like a dollar bill or something. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I can't figure out what it says, but uh, I'm just glad I got to see it. But That's so tiny. Yeah, maybe we'll, maybe we'll blow it up later, figure it out. So anyway, this is, you know, between this and this, by the way, uh, is known as bubble tag technology. Of course, once you open it too, it's, you're, you're not gonna have the wrapper, so that's just another little bit. But uh, yeah, so, so between Stuff like this, uh, the old way, stuff like this, and even tiny things with, uh, and, and holograms. Um, wine bottles are gonna get more complicated as a direct result of higher prices, as a result of trying to continue to do well, as a result of um, perhaps the trade war cooling off. Oh, so that's how the tipple will change. <laughs> sure. Yes. Uh, now, again, so there are gonna be more anti-counterfeiting measures, but this always leads me back to the blockchain. I feel like, you know, a lot of these I things- I am not gonna roll my eyes as hard this time. Thank you. I, I feel like a lot of these things could be faked. I mean, whether if it's something like this, where it's like wire netting, um, that could be greatly improved by something like adding adding these wines to the blockchain. I actually disagree with, it, it's a good thought, but I disagree with you for, for this reason. So over time, wine corks will disintegrate. Mm -hmm. and. This is actually something that counterfeiters took advantage of, which might be a point against me, but if you bring your wine to a winery, like a great, great wine to a winery after like 50 years, they might recork it for you. And so some counterfeiters actually did that with fake wine and got it, got the stamp of approval. Oh. However, that being said, so if this wine somehow, the, the cap started to disintegrate, and I actually brought it back to Chateau, uh, you know, I can't pronounce it, then, then this would be broken and according to the blockchain, oh, this wine was opened. If you have this bottle, it's, it's counterfeit. Well, not really. I mean, I like traditional contracts over blockchain because we humans can, can find ways to work with them and, and work around them. So there's a rigidity there that... That I, I don't think is appropriate for wine or for almost anything. I just, okay. that's my general feeling about blockchains. Like, I think contracts are pretty good. I just feel like there's no foolproof way to be completely, to make sure that something's not counterfeit. Yeah, but, but even with blockchain, I'm sure there would be ways, ways around, around it. it. Mm. Who knows? Um, so, so that's that's it. That's, that's why bottles getting more complicated. Yeah. Okay, so now we just have to make sure that there isn't some sort of blow up in China. I mean, mm -hmm. that's what this is predicated on. So whether it be, you know, tariffs or trade war or something escalates, or if, um, let's say, you know, there's, there's a housing bubble, there's all sorts of other things going on there. And so we might not necessarily see these counterfeiting or anti-counterfeiting measures. But the other thing that the wine, wine bottles are really a proxy for is uh, capital versus labor. Because wine bottles, have, you know, the epitome of luxury products, when, when wealth is distributed very evenly, mm -hmm. it's hard for anyone to pay half a million dollars for a wine bottle. Right. It depends on a world in which the very well off become even better off and yeah, and actually I feel like this is something that uh, the honey industry could take notes on because the honey industry, as we talked about recently, doesn't have 
or yeah. has a lot of fake honey in it, and uh, they don't really have anything quite so sophisticated, although I will say you're not buying half a million dollar tubs of honey. Not yet. Uh, I also, just as a final note, I do not think there's a relation between Barton Vodka and Chateau Leoville Barton, but uh, yeah, there's no way of knowing. Maybe, yeah, maybe, maybe it's like a parent company. Yeah, maybe they're related yeah, somehow. Be. Well, I, I think I've taken you from uh, trade to tipples, and uh, and you learned a word tipples. So yes, that, I learned good. a new word. Yes. Well, we have a new episode up every Thursday at realvision.com slash knock in effect. We also have a podcast episode that goes out on our feed, which is called Real Vision Presents. And if you go to that website, you can sign up for your 14-day free trial. And now's a great time to do it. Yes, indeed. There's a lot of uh, good interviews coming up. A lot going on in China. Kyle Bass talked about China. Yep. Um, and we have a, quite an interesting interview coming up on Friday this week as well, which I think you'll want to check out. Yeah. All right. See you guys next week. <laughs>